Well, there's still a lot going on at AWC. While you've been stuck at home in your pajamas, perhaps our ecologists and land managers are getting on with their work in the field. So across Northern Australia, prescribed burning is now underway from the Kimberley right through the top end to Cape York. Uh, we've got a team of ecologists out at the field research station in Artesian Range. And the New South Wales team has just finished their most recent survey of uh, bridled nail tail wallabies in the Pilliga. They're all going really well and there's some new recruits to that population. We're also in the final stages of preparations for a translocation at New Haven inside the stage one fence. So stay tuned and we'll, we'll keep you posted as soon as we've got news from there. All right, without further ado, uh, I'll introduce Andy Howe. Uh, Andy is coming to us live from the AWC office in Cairns, where he's based. Uh, Andy, welcome. And do you want to just um, talk to us about your situation? So you're, you're able to actually still go into the office despite the COVID restrictions, is that right? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Andy, um, based here in the Cairns office. So um, with the new restrictions, it's, it's a bit difficult for everybody to, to get together and, and work as a uh, a team on a daily basis here but basically we're just rotating through the office uh, one person per day at the moment uh, until the restrictions are lifted so um, we can still utilize this space um, but just unfortunately by ourselves at the moment. Right so um, you've set up a lovely virtual background for us with your palm trees and things in the background. Um, your work is normally around the sanctuaries in North Queensland um, so I might just pull up a map and do you want to tell us where you normally work and what sort of work you're involved with with the Northeast Field Ecology team? Sure. So um, as Joey said, we're the, the Northeast region for AWC. Uh, so we basically cover all of Queensland and the, the top end of the Northern Territory. You can see on the map there. Um, so we cover a, a huge scope of Australia. Um, across many sanctuaries and um, as you can see from the map you know we cover extremes in habitat and ecosystems as well so um, we go all the way from southeast Queensland and southwest Queensland um, right through to the wet tropics of Queensland to Cape York uh, into the Gulf of Carpentaria and then across into the top end and uh, over near the Kimberley there as well so a huge variety of uh, habitats and, and ecosystems and animals that we that we deal with in our region. And uh, basically we uh, conduct the AWC Eco Health Monitoring Program. So we monitor the health of, of all these sanctuaries through our uh, surveys, um, our generalized fauna surveys, as well as targeted surveys for certain threatened species as well. Um, and we carry those out on, on all of those properties that you can see on that map there. So that's a, a huge area to cover. And like you said, very diverse habitats and diverse wildlife. Yeah. How did you first get involved with AWC, Andy? What's your background? Yeah, so, I mean, I started uh, being exposed to AWC through volunteer work, like a lot of people do. Uh, so I volunteered when I started university studying. Uh, and over the course of about eight years, I volunteered on and off AWC at different sanctuaries. Um, and then, um, a position became uh, available in Cairns as the, the Northeast region was growing and I was uh, a successful candidate for the field ecologist role there. So uh, I had to move up to Cairns to, to take on this role there. Right, and you'd worked previously with wildlife uh, throughout Queensland. Do you want to talk about some of that experience? Yeah, prior to AWC, I was um, working on the largest koala tagging and monitoring project um, ever conducted in Australia. So that was in North Brisbane. Uh, and we had about 600 koalas that we uh, would go and, and monitor in the bush. And each one of those had uh, a GPS uh, tracker on it as well. Um, so basically we uh, tracked and monitored those koalas for about four years. Um, and then we did things like health assessments, vaccine trials, um, movement patterns, uh, Joey development, you know, the whole whole host of things that we were re researching on that project. So I've done that previously and also I've done um, a wildlife rescue job working for Australia Zoo prior to that. Uh, so a lot of hands-on work with, uh, you know, wild animals 
across vast areas of Queensland, I guess. Yeah. Um, and despite the restrictions in place at the moment, how much of your field work is able to continue? I, I believe you're just back from some field research uh, up in the wet tropics. Yeah, we, we have been limited like everybody else uh, with our travel. Uh, at the moment, we, we can't go up into Cape York and we can't go into the Northern Territory with the, the restrictions there, but we have a project a little bit closer to home up in the wet tropics. Uh, so I've just done a, a couple of days field work up there with the team where we went out and we're doing a Northern Betong project at the moment. Um, so we received some some government funding to, to carry out some research up there. And we went out to put out a whole heap of camera traps uh, to monitor uh, predators, things like cats, and also other threats to the betongs. And cattle is one of those threats uh, through competition with uh, food resources. Um, so we went out and put some cameras out and to monitor things like cats and, and cattle. So it was good to get out of the office and out into the bush for a little bit. Yeah, great. And just in case people are wondering, the Northern Betong is, I'll just bring up a picture. It's a small kangaroo relative. If you've been to Scotia or our sanctuaries in Western Australia, you might have met the burrowing betong uh, or the wheelie. This is the relative, the equivalent of those species that's found in North Queensland. It's incredibly rare. The numbers they estimate now are down below a thousand individuals. Uh, a large part of the reason that AWC purchased Mount Zero and Tarabale was to provide habitat for this species. We know that they were there historically and uh, in the next couple of years we're planning to reintroduce northern betongs to that sanctuary. So a lot of the research uh, and tracking work that Andy and the team are doing in the wet tropics around Davies Creek is looking at that wild population to assess their numbers and see if we can actually source some animals there for a translocation in the future. Um, so that's that's pretty exciting research and, and great that that's able to continue um, despite all the restrictions at the moment. So I guess we'll come to koalas, which is the moment everyone's been waiting for. Um, as we know, koalas have become kind of synonymous. They've become like the poster child for the impact that bushfires have had on wildlife. Um, Andy, as you said, you've had experience working with koalas before. Um, I've actually got some pictures that you sent me through from some of that work. Uh, here we are, just sharing them now. Now, koalas have this reputation as being very cute and cuddly, and who could deny it? Butter wouldn't melt. Um, this is a, a baby koala um, on the back of an adult, and this is from other work that you've done in the past. But that reputation might be a little bit overdone. I've heard they can get quite cranky sometimes as well. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't think such a cute little thing could be a bit grumpy sometimes. But uh, yes, you know, the, the, the postcard koala um, that does exist and koalas do become habituated to humans quite quickly. Um, so if they're born in captivity and they're, they're raised around humans, they, they do do this. Even though this is a wild koala in this photo, um, it's a joey, so it's not as dangerous as an adult, but um, they can be very cranky and feisty. Um, and they do have a, a quite a scary sounding growl as well. A lot of people have never heard of koala, but you know, they sharp claws, sharp teeth and, and a very um, menacing growl as well. But um, at the end of the day, they're still really cute. So we so do they, they sleep everything we can. And they do sleep for 20 hours a day. So these are not, not exactly monsters that we're talking about here. Yes. Um, the project that we're talking about today involves a population of koalas in the Blue Mountains, west of Sydney. Uh, and I'd like you to just talk about uh, that project. So it's with a group called Science for Wildlife, a, a local group based in the Blue Mountains. Um, and they've had this research program going on. Can you talk about the koalas that they're looking at and why they're so interested in that population in particular? Yeah, sure. So um, it came to their attention a, a couple of years ago that there was these uh, records of people seeing koalas in certain areas of the Blue Mountains, west of Sydney. And um, it was quite interesting because a lot of people had never seen them there before. There weren't known populations in those areas. So Science for Wildlife went out and actually discovered five small um, pockets of koalas within the Blue Mountains, which were previously undiscovered. Uh, so that they've gone in there and the Blue Mountains koalas at Canangra Boyd, uh, specifically where we went down and helped out. 
they're a really important population uh, because uh, of a few factors, but basically um, they're the most genetically diverse and distinct koalas in Australia. So that's really important for the survival of this population because a healthy genetics uh, allows them to be more robust and resistant to things like disease. Um, a lot of the koala populations in other areas, which are small and isolated, have very limited genetic diversity and they're, uh, I guess, you know, higher risk of suffering from um, genetic uh, disease things that come through and also uh, stress placed on them through human activity, so development and um, pet dogs, things like that. You know, if you have a low uh, genetic diversity, you're more adverse to things like disease. Um, they also live at a really high altitude as well. So these koalas that we were working with were above 1,100 metres in altitude. And actually in the, the winter time, they track these guys in the snow, which is incredible to me because all of my koala work has been in Queensland where we don't get snow and it's all very hot. But um, so there's those two factors. They're also disease free, which is one of only a couple of places in Australia where that has actually been detected. So they don't suffer from all the other diseases that are decimating koala populations elsewhere. Things like chlamydia, um, which is probably the most well-known disease that koalas suffer from. Um, there's actually been no chlamydia detected in any of these koalas in these Blue Mountains populations, which is really significant and, and you know, really encouraging that these koalas have one less threat that we know about. Uh, that could potentially impact them in the long run. Chlamydia free, I, I guess they must have been social distancing before it was cool. Um, <laughs> For a long time. So, so that's the, the location map you can see there. I think the remarkable thing is that this population, as you said, it's only just been discovered in the last few years, and yet it's what 150 kilometres west of Sydney mm -hmm. um, in the Blue Mountains. So fantastic that there's a population hanging on there. Um, and that this local group has committed to finding out more about them. Um, but then the bushfires came. So uh, late last year, as we all know, bushfires spread throughout southeastern Australia. Uh, and in fact, the area of temperate forest that was affected by bushfires uh, was about seven and a half million hectares in the southeast. The local group Science for Wildlife decided that they weren't going to stand by and watch bushfires take out uh, that, that section of habitat where the population was persisting um, and actually sprang into action to rescue those koalas. Um, a really bold move. Can you talk about that rescue and how many koalas they managed to save? Yeah, sure. So uh, as the, 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 the fires were burning down in that particular area, um, Kelly, who's the director of science for wildlife had this bold plan to get approval um, because you just can't go out and there and do these things. You have to get approval and it's a dangerous situation. Um, and a lot of resources were being uh, taken up elsewhere as well. But um, basically she came up with a plan to go into the bush as the fires were approaching, rescue as many koalas as possible from this population, take them into captivity. Uh, and then that would eliminate the, the immediate bushfire threat uh, to these particular individuals. So they actually got out there on the ground within, you know, 24 hours uh, and caught 12 koalas from this particular population. Um, they were already monitoring these particular koalas, so they knew exactly where they were, uh, which made the time frame really quick to go and find them. Um, so they were lucky enough to go in there and, and, and get all 12 koalas uh, and pull them out before the fire front came through, which was extremely lucky because the bush was the bush was absolutely torched where they were found so um you know i i, I highly doubt many of those koalas would have survived had they been left where they were so you arrived on the ground quite a few weeks after the fire in fact um after that regeneration had started to take place um so can you describe the scenes on the ground when you got there how intense had the fire been through the areas where those ko koalas had been rescued? Yeah, so where we had gone in, uh, where the, the access was permitted for us, because we had to wait such a long time for the area to be deemed safe um, for us to actually get in there after the fire. Um, so you can see in the photo in the background, 
you know, um, there, there was regrowth happening when we were there, but essentially, you know, the, the bush had been burnt from the, the ground layer right up to the, the treetops and the canopy of the trees. So, and this is, you know, not a localized fire, it was extensive on a landscape scale. So, you know, everything was devastated from horizon to horizon. Um, there was very small pockets of bush that had lower intensity fire on them and they had fared better, but the majority of the bush had just been totally burnt from the ground to the treetops. So for those of us that live nearby, um, I was in the Blue Mountains at the end of December at that time, and that Gospers Mountain fire was really terrifying. It, it took out a huge amount of bush uh, throughout Blue Mountains National Park uh, and further north through, through the Wollamai. Um, but these 12 koalas that had been rescued were safe in Taronga Zoo uh, by the time that that fire arrived in that area. So then eventually by about mid-February the fires were mostly out and there was a whole lot of heavy rain uh, through February and March um, that led to that regeneration that you're talking about. So at what point was it decided that the koalas could be released again back in that area and, and what are the triggers for that? Yeah so as you said the region didn't receive quite a lot of rain immediately uh, after the bushfire. Um, it's quite unfortunate that it didn't happen before but um, that's the way things go. But yeah, I mean, the, the bush was already in a really poor state before the fire as well, due to prolonged drought as well. Um, so after the rain had come, it had taken quite a few weeks. And then the Aussie bush being the Aussie bush is quite resilient. And it had started to rejuvenate quite extensively in the areas where these koalas had been uh, caught from. So uh, again, Kelly from Science for Wildlife was making um, you know, like weekly observations of the area, using a lot of mapping as well, um, satellite imagery to see how the canopy was recovering, especially. So, um, you know, I think most people know that koalas are quite picky eaters. And even though there's lots of uh, eucalypts out there and, and gum trees, they only eat a, a very small proportion of those. So she was going out on the ground and seeing which of their favorite food species had begun to sprout new growth. And that is the koalas ultimate food is the fresh new leaf tip that comes. Um, they will eat that first before eating the old, uh, harder, dry leaves. So um, with that rainfall, the bush had suddenly sprung to life again. In certain areas, certain areas were that badly burnt that they were still quite devastating. Um, but this particular area where the koalas came from had come back quite nicely. And a lot of that new growth had come through and it was deemed that there was enough food to sustain this, these koalas to go back out into the wild. Now, um, this is where you come into the picture. So uh, at that stage, as, as the bush was regenerating, as the fires were going out, AWC reached out to a number of uh, different local conservation groups right across the fire impacted area from Kangaroo Island, right up to the north coast of New South Wales, as we talked about last week. Uh, but the requirements to help Science for Wildlife were quite specific. So we were looking for a certified tree climber who was also an ecologist with experience handling koalas, which is where you came into the picture, Andy. Um, I've just got an image of you here. Can you talk about what sort of, you know, what it's like climbing trees and, you know, their particular skills you need to catch koalas? Um, what does that work involve? Yeah, so um, with my, my previous work prior to AWC, um, if you work with koalas a lot, you have to catch the koalas. So one of the, the best and quickest ways to do that is to actually get up in the tree with them. You know, some, some of the trees they live in are enormous. So you kind of have to get up there into the tree and the only way you can do that, or one, one of the ways, the main way is by climbing the tree. Um, so it's a certification that I, I got a few years ago and um, it's really handy for doing a lot of this work. So we basically have to climb up into the tree uh, get the koala down into a position where we can either catch it in the tree or bring it down the trunk of the tree and it can be caught on the ground. Um, and then we can do our health assessments. We can fit radio collars, GPS collars, um, and monitor the koalas down on the ground, which is a lot easier than looking through binoculars in the tops of the trees. And uh, You can do a lot of things like assessing their pouch young and their joeys for development. Um, something that you just don't have the opportunity to up in the, when we're sitting up in the tops of the trees. 
Joey development is very important that that continues <laughs> throughout the life. Um, all right, so initially they were released into a sort of soft release area. What was the advantage of doing it that way rather than just letting them out um, straight into the bush? Yeah, so the koalas that were brought into captivity went into Taronga Zoo for a few months. Uh, that was the facility that was able to house them. Um, so when they were ready to come back out, we built these soft release enclosures that you can see on the picture there. And basically we just encompassed a few different species of trees out in the bush. Um, ones that had new growth on the, the treetops so that they could feed. And because they've been in captivity for a little while, um, it's good to just do a self-assessment of the koalas uh, upon release. So we make sure they're climbing fine, they've got no, um, I guess, kind of niggling injuries or anything that they may have picked up at some point or that was unknown to us, and that they're strong enough to physically climb the trees themselves. Um, so what we did is we released them into these, this small little area. We um, kept an eye on them really closely for 24 hours. And once we, that we deemed that they were, they were fine, they were climbing, they were strong, um, they weren't stressed out by the whole experience. Then we took down this, uh, this small fenced area and then they were allowed to move off into the bush uh, on their own accord. But um, all the koalas were released back into the area where they were caught and their original home range. Right. And then for the, the period just after their release, oh, actually at this point, I might just mention that um, anyone tuning in can ask a question. So if there's anything that you'd like answered, uh, we can take questions in the chat. So just type in the little chat bar at the bottom. Um, at the end, we'll unmute your microphone and you can ask uh, to the group or ask Andy and I uh, what your question is and, um, and we'll try and address it. Um, so bring the questions on. We've already had some sent in, thank you. Um, Andy, I just wanted to ask too about tracking the koalas after the fires. So you don't just release them out out of that soft release area uh, and let them do their thing, there's a period where they're radio tracked as well. So were all of the Taronga koalas fitted with radio collars? Yeah, yep. So the koalas will continue to go into the monitoring program that Science for Wildlife has in the Blue Mountain. Uh, so each of the koalas were released with a small uh, little collar that has a little VHF uh, radio tracking device on it. So that allows us to go and track them we track them every day for two weeks uh, after release. And then once that they're deemed to be uh, doing fine and there's no issues, then that tracking schedule will, will um, peter out and it'll be uh, once a week or once every two weeks or something just to keep an eye on them. But, but basically that just allows us to see how far they move each day and where they're going. We can determine their home range uh, from those movement activities. We can see what other koalas they're interacting with as well. Um, so it's a really important tool for the research and understanding that specific koala's community uh, there in Kanangra Boy. Um, we had a question before we actually started the webinar today, sent in by someone who'd registered, interested in how things all fit together in an ecosystem. So, um, you know, that often comes up and it, it gets to quite a philosophical question really, you know, what's the point of a koala? Why does it matter that we have koalas surviving in the ecosystem? What role do they play? Apart from being super cute. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're an Australian icon and for good reason, I think, because, um, you know, I, I guess the, the biggest role that koalas play in the environment is that they act as an umbrella species for everything that lives within their, uh, their habitat and their ecosystem. So, if the koala's doing fine and the koalas are protected, then everything that lives within that environment underneath those koalas is also being protected and also being conserved. So um, they, they do play a role, I guess a smaller role in the environment than that big overarching umbrella role. But, um, but basically they do, they're an iconic species that if we can protect koalas, then everything else that lives around koalas will also have a really good shot. Um, but in a more of a, uh, an environmental sense that um, they're actually a proportion of food source for other predators uh, in the environment, which a lot of people probably wouldn't associate koalas with being, you know, preyed on by other things. But um, 
there's a couple of species of very large owl that prey on koalas, especially joeys. Um, so they provide a, a, an important food source for them. Um, and also things like large uh, pythons, carpet pythons also predate on koalas, um, which is an interesting little fact. But, but both of these, especially the things like large owls and snakes, um, are also threatened in our ecosystem. So protecting the koalas also protects these other species as well. Right, so we're saving them just to be eaten by other predators. No, but I, I think your point that, you know, they're, they're really iconic. And we saw um, the amount of traction that, um, you know, the attention that was focused on Australia in the wake of the bushfires. This is an image from Times Square in New York uh, in the weeks after the bushfires. So, you know, koalas really do represent Australian wildlife. They're iconic in that way. Um, I think the other point here is just that, you know, the Australian bush is supposed to be full of animals. There's supposed to be koalas in the trees, bettons on the ground, potterers, bandicoots. And you will have heard us say this before, but it's been described as a marsupial ghost town. We're missing a whole chunk of the biodiversity from across the country. And anywhere you go, what we see today is depauperate compared to the animals that would have been there in the past. So, you know, I think there's value, inherent value in saving koalas as well. Um, I'd like to really formally acknowledge Science for Wildlife for the opportunity to be involved. They were, um, I gather, really, really good to work with, Andy, um, and we hope that we can support them and, um, and work with them in the future as well. Now, we've been going for half an hour, we might come to some questions and answers. So we've got a number of questions in the chat here. The first one, and if you like, we'll take you off mute so you can ask yourself. The first question is from Julie Mills. Um, so Julie, we'll just get you unmuted and you should be able to go ahead and ask the question. We got you there, Julie. Hi, Andy. Hi, Joey. Hi, um, listen, I was curious as to, I, I've been talking to Kelly um, about those koalas and hearing about their progress because she's looking at coming down here and doing some work down here. Um, but I'm curious about how far they would travel on average each day and how many trees they would actually feed from in an average day. And, and, and do they eat the epicormic growth or do they only eat the developed leaves? Andy? Yeah, so they definitely eat the epicormic growth. I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, so that's, that's one of those factors how we knew that it was uh, time that it, it was okay that there's enough food in the ecosystem to release them because um, that fresh new growth, even though uh, there's a lot of myths out there that they don't eat it, but I've, I've seen them eating it and um, at more than one side as well, different locations around New South Wales since the bushfires. Um, so that's a, that's a yes. In terms of how far they move each day, that's very dependent on the individual koala. Um, sometimes koalas, after being brought in captivity, being treated for injury or disease or in this scenario, uh, when you re-release them again, sometimes they just bolt and they just get as far away from wherever just what just happened to them as possible. Um, the koalas that we released in Kanangra Boyd, they all seem to hang around the release area uh, to some degree since since release, but some of the males um, will have a, a bigger territory than, than the females, so they often travel a lot further. Um, and some of the sub-adult males will also have to travel further again um, purely because they have to find their own territory. So the big boys will push them out and they may travel further than, than the females and the adult males that are already there. But um, in, in the Blue Mountains where we were, the Kanangra Void, it seems like they went a long way um, purely because it's so mountainous and hilly that you have, to get to them you have to hike up and down the hills. But uh, in reality, it's, it's not really that far. Um, but yeah, th these guys were quite well behaved when we were there. So they uh, saved our legs lots of kilometres of walking up and down hills, that's for sure. Thanks for the question, Joy. Um, the second question here is from Mei Ling. Um, so we'll unmute you, Mei Ling. Um, just doing that now. Thanks, Joseph. And um, just to let you know, I'm here with my six and my eight-year-old boys. So thank you so much for this amazing educational webinar. We're really enjoying it. Um, 
Yeah, look, I guess we were just interested in, in the, the, the anticipated scope of the impact on the koala population nationally. Do we have any sense for, you know, I mean, I know there's only we're not a large number of koalas in the first place, but just, yeah, do you have any sense of what the impact was? Um, Andy, do you want to take that first? I've, I've got some rough figures here. So, um, well, yeah, I'll just say what the estimates are. There are various estimates and it depends who's been doing the calculating. One of the problems is there's no robust estimate of population for most uh, states anyway. In New South Wales, estimates range from 5,000 to 10,000 koalas killed directly in the fires uh, and many more on Kangaroo Island. That's a bit of a different situation because they were kind of introduced there in a feral population. In the mid north coast of New South Wales, they're looking at about 30% of the population for that area that's been lost. Um, so a significant impact. I guess the good news from the Blue Mountains was that a number of animals survived the fires. So Andy, you picked up a number of animals there that uh, hadn't been known about before that had made it through. Yeah, and I mean, the, the scenes that we saw when we turned up, you know, unfortunately, I would have guessed that a vast proportion of the population at Canangra Boyd um, probably didn't make it. Um, but encouraging, encouragingly, when we were there, um, we did find three new koalas to the project. Um, so two boys and a girl, um, which is really encouraging that some did survive the fires. And we did get those koalas down and catch them and do a health assessment on them. Um, they all had no uh, burn injuries that we could ascertain. It didn't look like they had any healed burn injuries either. So I think they avoided the flames outright, which is miraculous. Um, they were also in really, really good condition. They had a really good body score. They had good muscle. They had no uh, wastage. Um, so it just seems that the koalas that did survive um, are hardy individuals. And um, that, like I was talking about before, that genetic diversity um, that they carry will go on. Um, but yeah, un unfortunately, koala populations it did take a big hit. Um, and like you said, you know, I think koalas were already in trouble before the bushfires and before the drought that came before that. Um, drought also really devastates koala populations as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there's good stories, uh, things that we didn't expect coming out of this, this story that koalas did survive some of these horrific fires, but um, yeah, that they definitely took a hard impact as well, which is concerning. Um, at this point, I just want to let you know about the upcoming webinars. We'll be sending out the invite for the, the next few instalments in the next couple of days. But next week's one, at the same time on Thursday, uh, will be with the Kimberley operations team. I'll be talking to Toby Barton. Uh, he's up there at Charlie River with the team doing prescribed burning across the Kimberley, across several million hectares. Um, so if anyone's especially interested in our approach to fire management, um, and in particular how we've changed fire management across a, a broad area in Northern Australia, definitely make sure you tune in next week um, and we'll talk more about our approach. Another question here from Angela Draycott. Uh, Angela, we're unmuting you, um, so hopefully you can ask your question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, sorry, one second. There. Can you hear me now? Can hear you, yep. Hi, thanks. Thanks for doing this. Um, my question was a little bit uh, relating to Julia. I was just curious about um, whether, you know, there are chips in them or trans, you know, transmitters or anything so that you can kind of, you know, keep track of how they're doing, whether they're surviving, how, you know, following them. Yep. Digitally. Yeah, so each of the 12 koalas that were re-released back into the bush and the three additional ones that we found while we were there. Um, they all were wearing these small um, collars that had a small VHF tracking device on them. Um, so we can monitor them whenever we want to. Um, so it was daily. We went and checked on these koalas daily for uh, the first couple of weeks. And that just allows us to um, keep a really good eye on them, assess their condition, how they're coping being back out in the wild. Um, and then essentially until that, that little battery runs out, which, which could be in two years time, 
um, you can go, you can pick up the signal and, and go and track those quails whenever you, you need to, for whatever reason that you need to. Great. Okay, uh, another question here from Andrew Morgan. Uh, Andrew, we'll unmute you. All right, fire away. Yeah, hi, Joey and Andy. Um, the group that you worked on, you saved 12 koalas. Were there only 12 in that population, or was 12 a small part of that population? And what of the other small isolated groups that you mentioned? Is there any news on how they, how they fared? Yeah, so the, the 12 that were re-released, that was just a portion of the population that was in this specific area. Um, they, these were just uh, koalas that had already uh, had the collars on them before the fire. Um, so the guys from Science for Wildlife were able to rush out there, track each of these 12 koalas, find exactly where they were and get them down and into captivity. Um, there is definitely more wild koalas out there. We caught those three additional ones um, while we were releasing the, the, the 12. Um, so there definitely is more koalas out there and it was encouraging to see three um, within the zone that these other 12 came from. Um, there are definitely some areas of that national park where I probably wouldn't expect any koalas to survive just based on the intensity of their fire. Um, but there must have been small pockets where these other three survived. So um, we can only hope that there's many more out there, even though I think this population is quite small. Um, but at the moment, nobody knows because they're so new to science. Um, in terms of the other populations that are around the Blue Mountains area, um, there hasn't been a lot of work done on them. I think a lot of the, uh, the effort and the focus has been on one or two of these populations because they're, they're new to, newly discovered. Um, and it's just going to take a bit of time. And, and I think access is a, is a really hard issue to deal with because um, if anyone's been to these Blue Mountains areas, um, access is, is really quite limiting in some spots uh, and it's really hard to get in there. Um, but yeah, in terms of those, other, those four other small populations in the Blue Mountains, uh, it's kind of a question mark at this point and that's something that uh, Kelly from Science Wildlife is looking to pursue in the next couple of years and, and get out there and, and really knuckle down on those little populations that are left. I just wanted to add here that uh, AWC is now actively looking for parcels of land which do have healthy populations of koalas where we might be able to make a substantial significant impact to protect a population. We've already got koalas in small numbers at Mount Zero Taravale and at Curramore in southern Queensland. So we do protect them on our sanctuaries, but we'd really like a larger project in the southeast of the country where we can make a really significant difference to their population. That's something on our radar at the moment, um, but obviously an acquisition project requires a whole lot of capital uh, to, to initiate. Um, I'd like to thank all of you who've tuned in today. Um, it's been really interesting. And thank you, Andy, for, uh, for talking to us. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for your support. Without your help, we couldn't have done any of these bushfire recovery projects. I think uh, over Eri's chat last week and, and talking to Andy today, you can see that AWC is dedicated to making a, a significant difference. Uh, we're, we're committed to effective conservation and in times of crisis, like these bushfires, we're embracing that spirit of collaboration um, among the conservation community. I think there is a sense of hope for wildlife offered by these sorts of projects. Um, the reason we're able to make such a significant difference is that we've got people out there on the ground, even amid coronavirus, uh, even in the aftermath of a big disaster like the bushfires, who can go out and rescue animals in a hands-on way. We can monitor populations um, and make sure that things are able to recover effectively. So thank you all for your support. Uh, if you did ask a question which we didn't get to, um, please, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you. So we'll email with a response to you. If there's anything else that has come up that you'd like more information about, get in touch. Um, as I said, next week, we'll be talking about fire management in the Kimberley and more broadly in Northern Australia. So don't miss that one. Um, but for now, I think that's it. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, we'll talk to you next time.